صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذنومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابنها مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذنوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم والأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم عمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Amongst the easiest ways to build a relationship with our Creator is by means of making dua, by means of supplicating to our Creator. Dua is something that many of us have been taught to do. We fail to understand that dua is a unique etiquette in order for it to be allowed to be returned and receptive by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't just go and make dua at any day and at any time and, ex and, and expect for it to be accepted. Not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will absolutely not accept it without the certain prerequisites. But like anything else, in the case that you want to take benefit from it, that you want for it to bear its fruit, you need to fulfill certain prerequisites. And when it comes toward the supplications that we have and that have been taught to us by the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them, or even the personal supplications that we make toward our Creator, it's important again to understand that there are certain prerequisites and certain etiquettes in order to allow for it to really bear the fruit of that which we are intending. So for instance, we're told that when we are to standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making dua to Him, it's important that our minds are clear and our hearts are clear, and that we're asking God for God's sake so we're not asking God solely for the thing that I'm seeking. What am I trying to say? Is that many times we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we want something. We want this job. We want this investment. We want this wealth. We want to pass this exam. We want to be successful in whatever it is that we want to be successful in. And the only reason or the only time we ever supplicate is when we want something in return from our Creator in a way that's very transactional. Oh God, I will do this, but then you have to do this for me. And then when we don't get it, we wonder why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not responding to my dua and I'm not going to make dua tomorrow or ever again because He never responds to my dua in the first place. What I mean or what the traditions of Ahlul Bayt mean when they state that in order to have your supplication answered and responded to by the Creator, make sure that you're always asking God for dua. So when you actually want something, you're, there's a higher potential for you to receive that. In a hadith al-Qudsi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reveals toward the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salam. He states, Ya Ahmed, i'raf ilayya thirrakha, a'arifuka thishidda. He states, O Muhammad, remember me in the good times, and I will remember you during your difficult times. It's really easy to remember God when we're going through something, when we need something. What's hard to do is remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when everything is going great. Because we just assume that all of this is a blessing from God anyway. So why do I need to make dua to Him? Or why do I even need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because I did it. I'm the one who passed that exam. I'm the one who worked really hard and got that job. I'm the one who made all of that money. I'm the one who built this. I'm the one who did that. Someone who's always talking about themselves and always projecting the I, 
have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the center of their life. I built this, I established this, I created this, I worked for this. All of a sudden, where's God in the equation? You're doing it for yourself, you're doing it to feed your own ego, or you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when, again, when you remove God from the equation, especially when it comes toward good times, then when the difficulty comes, we raise our hands to our Creator, Oh Allah, remove me from this. There's a good chance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same way that you weren't remembering Him, when things were all going well, you're going to choose to sort of postpone responding toward your supplication. Someone says, that's kind of cruel. Why would the All-Merciful do something like that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes needs to work toward cultivating our hearts and our souls in a way whereby we have reached a state because at the end of the day, it's all about proximity to Him. This long life of ours is a journey to get, pro to get closer and to seek a sense of proximity toward our Creator. Which is why every single day when we stand in prayers, what do we state? That our intention on praying three raka of Maghrib prayers, qurbatan in Allah ta'ala. What does qurbatan in Allah mean? It means to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally, qurba, to see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, it won't be a problem then if I try to draw you a little bit closer to me by not responding to your dua right now. And this idea of seeking closeness then to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is understood on a lot of unique levels when we take a look at the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, when we take a look at their supplications, when we take a look at the outline or the designation or the curriculum, so to say, that the Prophet and his family have laid out for us in terms of how we can get to the highest level in terms of that proximity. Because again, at the end of the day, it's about getting proximity to God. Of course, not physical proximity, but of course we're speaking about this notion of spiritual proximity. And amongst the highest levels that a believer can attain in this idea of spiritual proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is whereby we love God, but even greater than that, that God loves us back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certainly loves all of His creation. But to truly become the epitome of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or amongst those who are known as the awliya of Allah, His closest friends or how it's often translated as the saints of God, like anything else and like everything else, that requires a lot of work. That requires a lot of effort. But if that's not the end goal of where we want to be, then again, we're not exactly sure where it is that we want to be in the first place. One of the names of the Messenger وسلم, one of the ways that we address him is that we call him Habiba Ilah al Alameen. He is the beloved of the Lord of the worlds. And if every single day that we come toward these gatherings in the name of the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them, and I've said this so many times, the end goal of the ritual is that we're walking in the footsteps of Imam al Hussein. Walking in the footsteps of Imam al Hussein is walking in the footsteps of the Prophet of God. It's walking in the footsteps of this most perfect, immaculate, infallible family. And who they were was the most beloved in the sight of the Creator. So what does it mean then to become from amongst those who are beloved in the sight of the greatest of all creators? The King of the heavens and the earth. The Creator of all of this. We come and we see that we get a couple of insights and manifestations of this reality from the du'as of Ahlul Bayt Let me take a look at a couple of them. In du'a command, for instance, Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he states, فَحَبْنِي يَا إِلَٰهِي وَسَيِّدِي وَمَوْلَايَ وَرَبِّي سَبَرُتُ عَلَىٰ أَذَابِكْ فَكَيْفَ أَسْبِرُ عَلَىٰ فِرَاقِكْ O oh Allah, O oh my master, O oh my king, O oh my sustainer, let's say, this is the words of Ali alayhi salam, Dua Kuman is really incredible. You guys should follow my weekly Instagram stories where I commentate on Dua Kuman. We've taken a little bit of a break for the last two months, but they'll be back inshallah. In this, the Imam alayhi salam, he states, O oh Allah, suppose that I'm able to bear patiently the punishment of the fires of hell. Sabartu ala adabik. 
Oh Allah, let's say that I'm able to remain patient in the midst of that punishment of yours. Do you know how severe the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is? We don't know. Our intellects cannot bear it. As much as we love to talk about mercy, as we have to talk about the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, also don't lose sight of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shadid al-iqab. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has certainly, out of His promise, created a place in His divine realm whereby to punish those who have transgressed His boundaries. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that punishment. He states, Sabartu ala adabik. Oh Allah, let's say that I'm able to sit there and receive all of your punishment. فَكَيْفَ أَسْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ فراقك. This is Ma'rafa of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He states, Oh Allah, I'll take the punishment, it's okay. But how am I going to deal with being away from you? How am I going to deal with being in a space that's in terms of distance of physical or spiritual proximity from you, Oh Allah? The punishment I'm okay with. There's a hadith that states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the worst of the creation, those oppressors and those who take the rights of other people, those who have oppressed the family of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon them, that for them there's a space that's reserved in the fires of hell, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will close the doors and He will make it oblig obligatory upon Himself to forget they exist. That's scary. That's scary. Imagine for one moment. Think about where we have made mistakes. Then imagine for one moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forget in the afterlife, but in this life, He forgot about us. He left us to be on our own. What would we be? Who would we be? For one day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not in the equation. Even though in our lives, He's not part of the equation for many of us. I talk about myself. But imagine in the divine realm of the Creator, He removed us from His memory. We're screwed. We're in trouble. What's going to happen to us? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, says, I don't worry about anything, but the only thing that I worry about is being in that state of proximity to you, O oh Allah. فَكَيْفَ أَسْبِرُوا عَلَىٰ فراقك? If you continue to read the words of Dua Kumail, of the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, you see the manifestation of love in these lines of his supplication. In another line it is stated from Imam Zain al-Abideen a line that I uttered a couple of nights ago, it states, Ilahi man ladhi dhaqa halawata mahabbatak farama min kabadara Oh Allah, who has tasted the sweetness of your love and found anything else? That man who stood in performing the night prayer for more than 40 consecutive nights. When you feel the presence of God, you're not worried about any of your du'as because you felt the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When your mind is so fixated on God, you're not concerned about the dunya. That's not to say that all of these luxuries again that we have in this world are bad. What I'm trying to say is that we need to work and we need to strive toward that higher sense toward that higher ma'rifa, toward that higher understanding of love of the Creator, where again, He places His love in our hearts. And when we want to reflect upon this idea and this notion of what it means to be a beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within Islamic tradition, I want to reflect upon this theme in, th in three different dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the levels of love as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt والسلام, speak to. Secondly, in terms of what are the hurdles that one encounters in terms of becoming a beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And thirdly, in reflecting upon the qualities of the beloved of the Creator. So again, we go to that first dimension then. What are the levels of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And according to our traditions, and according to our scholars of ethics, there are three levels of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every single human being has to seek and has to aspire to. But before it, let me just say this, that the power of love 
really has a great potential that's very transformative. What do I mean? That if someone loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much, they're going to dedicate their life towards seeking that sense of proximity toward God because nothing matters but love. If someone wants to get married to someone, they're going to allow for all of the obstacles to come in their way and none of those are going to bother them because they're going to keep on striving to making sure that this relationship works. Family, parents, community, individual issues within the relationship, it doesn't matter. You're going to work toward fighting in order to make it work because that's what love just calls to. Sometimes we come and we see that love is really, really painful but it's really hard to remove it from our heart. I'm a Knicks fan, I know. <laughs> I love the New York Knicks, and I have to go through a lot of pain, but every single time I try to tell myself, just let it go, I can't, because that love runs so deep. Make to offer my Knicks. <laughs> Last night, I told our brother, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, I told him, hey man, come out of retirement, you're 50 years old, it looks super fit, man, 50 years old. I said, why don't you just come out of retirement to play for the Knicks? He said, even if they offered me a contract and they offered me the millions of dollars, he said, I'd go to the Nets. <laughs> I take the veterans minimum over there. I hate all you Nets fans. <laughs> you guys ruined my life. Huh? Oh, man. So what I'm trying to say is that when you love something, it doesn't matter what hurdle comes in your way, you're always seeking and you're always striving toward getting to that ultimate destination. And the idea is to allow for our hearts toward transforming, toward understanding that the only love that is important is the love of our Creator. Loving family, loving children, loving parents, those can all be manifestations of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because God gave them to us as a trust and as a responsibility. And when we go toward understanding these three levels of love or these three different opinions of what it means toward loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we come and we see that there is one opinion that states that the only reason why the human being loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again going back to that idea that I mentioned earlier because it's transactionary. I love God and God gives me things. In the same way that for instance, that a child, you give them something and they're immediately going to like you. You give them a lollipop, they're going to like you because they know that from you they can get something. And when you don't give it to them, they don't like you anymore. That's it. It's the reality. Because their intellects have not been fashioned toward that extent where they're able to understand that sometimes these things that we're giving you might not be good for you and the reason why I'm not giving it to you is because I love you. When it comes to the human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again as we mentioned a couple of nights ago, has fashioned within the human being the love of things. Zuyyina linnas hubbu shahawat. He created us the love of really nice, tangible things. We worship God because we want Him to respond toward our du'a. We worship God because we want Him to improve our health. We worship God because we want Him to allow for us to pass our test. We worship God because we want to get a job. We worship God because we want wealth. We worship God even if because we want paradise. Is that what it's about? God created you so you work, that you pray, that you fast, so that you get paradise? That's not the purpose of creation. We talked about that the other night. That's so shallow, if you really think about it. Not that it's bad to think that way, it's a process. And that's the way that we know things, that's the way that we understand things. Our kids, again, they're only going to understand that they love us or that we love them when we give them something for the good things that they do. Even at work, for instance, we work so we can get a paycheck. Is that the way that our relationship with our Creator is? Or that's, is that the way that our relationship with our Creator should be? No. There has to be something deeper than that. There has to be something far greater than just, I'm going to do something, so God is going to give it back to me. So the first opinion states, and probably on a very basic, shallow level, that the way or the reason why we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because God gives us things in return. The second opinion, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because God has created us with this fitrah, 
this innate nature again, whereby we have the ability to perceive Him. And within that innate nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to be receptive of all of His names and all of His attributes. That every single human being loves compassion and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all compassionate. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within the human being the love of justice and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adil, He is the all just. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within the human being the love of generosity and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the all generous. Again, going back to this value-based or quality-based or sort of value-based sort of system. We love, all of, we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He has fashioned us with the qualities that He is. And it's easy for us to be receptive to Him because He has given us this ability to be receptive to Him. So deep down within us, every single one of us have the ability to love our Creator. But sometimes we need to dig out all of the darkness in terms of understanding that really we love, cre we love compassion, we love mercy, we love generosity, and we also want to manifest those qualities to the best of our abilities. Let me give you an example. On the day of Ashura, there's a man by the name of Abis ibn Shabib. Abis is this incredible companion of Imam al Hussein. I didn't speak about him on the night in which he recollected the tragedy of the companions. But Abbas was a man who was amongst the companions of Imam Ali السلام, in the battle of Safin against Muawiyah. And he had been injured in that battle. And he was a really brave and courageous warrior defending Ali ibn Abi Talib. By the time it got to Karbara, Abbas was very elderly. And when he went out toward fighting and defending Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam, he went and he entered into the middle of the battlefield and he ran into the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad and everyone just dispersed. They were scared of him. He was a man with really no fear. And as he entered into the middle of the battlefield, just everyone just parted and also they felt bad for him almost because he was an elderly man. And they didn't want to be the one to kill him. So he took off his helmet, he took off his armor. He said, which one of you are going to kill me? And Abbas then took his sword and he went to the right and he went to the left. And all of a sudden, the army of Umar ibn Sa'd, they surrounded him. And as was the custom that you're not just going to, you know, lie down and die. But Abbas ibn Shabib, he stood up. And instead of going and trying to fight one of them and fend one of them off, Abbas just tried to take all of them on at the same time. He was in his 80s according toward the traditions and according to the report of the historians. Over 80 years old. And he's just going and he's trying to pierce through all of these 40, 50, 70 people who are surrounding him. And they call out, Oh Abbas, what's wrong with you? Ajunint. You've gone crazy. What are you trying to do? He says, Na'am hubbul Hussein ajannani. The love of Hussein has made me go crazy. Why? What allowed for this man, who was a man of intellect, a man of rationale, a scholar, a man who had seen so much, who had been through so much, what allows him to reach that state of emotion? What he calls crazy, what he calls mad in the way of Hussein. Because he recognized that the only thing that his heart can contain are the qualities of Hussein. And that the only thing that he could do then is defend the qualities and the values of Hussein Nothing else mattered except for his love of his master Hussein, who is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. Nothing else matters. Sometimes the only thing that we see is the creator. The only thing that we see is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we love God that much, the only thing that we are seeing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abbas on the day of Ashura, the only thing that he saw was through the light of God and that's Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Hear what I'm saying. And that brings me then to the third level of love. And that's the highest level. The first one, again, is that we love God because God gives us things in return. The second is that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because God has created within our innate nature the ability to see His names and His attributes. 
And the third is that love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He places in our hearts because He sees us trying to seek proximity to Him. Now this is important. Sometimes we try our best and we try to get closer toward God, but we see these hurdles on our way. And then sometimes we see that there are certain moments in our life which are sort of breakthrough moments. The month of Ramadan, a recitation of the Qur'an that you were reading or that you listened to, or dua that you were supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. There are certain moments where all of a sudden you just see the light of God and it just starts to take you and it allows for you to step away from all of that vice and all of that sin and all of those transgressions. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states that when my believer, they take one step toward me, I take two steps toward him. Or according to another tradition, when they walk toward me, I run toward them. And I become the eyes through which they see, and the feet through which they walk, and the hand through which they grasp. What is that? Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you striving in His way, and He says, I'll take care of it from here. And He places His love in your heart and allows again for the facilitation of that process of proximity toward Him to be seamless. Just takes those initial steps. It takes that initial striving and you will see that God will bring your heart in proximity toward Him because He's waiting for you to knock the door. But sometimes for whatever reason that door doesn't open or our eyes don't see that door. And that brings me then to the second dimension. What are some of those hurdles that do not allow for us to perceive the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You see, my dear friends, when we come and we take a look at every single aspect of our life, when we see any sense of deficiency, we're always ready toward fixing it. We're always ready toward reconciling it as soon as we possibly can. If we're not good at school from a very young age, we go to extra help. In college, we don't understand a subject, we go to office hours. At work, for instance, if you're not good at your task, you make sure that you're spending extra hours toward demonstrating toward your superiors that you're ready to learn to making sure that you're able to be good and to be able to fulfill your tasks and your responsibilities. It's a natural part of life. If we see a deficiency with our body at the same time, you have a deficiency of iron or this vitamin or that vitamin, you go and you make sure you're taking supplements or you go and you see a doctor. We're always ready to go and fixing and diagnosing any issue or any hurdle or any obstacle that we encounter within our life very quickly. It would be silly for us to not do that. If, for instance, I got a cut on my finger right now, and my finger started to bleed, what would I do? Would I look at my finger and watch the blood begin to gush out of my thumb, fall all over my hand and onto my clothes, and then just look at it and say, oh man, this, this sucks. I'm bleeding from my finger. And not look at anyone and say, hey, can anyone get me a Band-Aid? Can someone get me a tissue? Let me go and fix this problem. Or even something more horrific. Someone cuts off your finger. God forbid, na'udhu billah. Salaamu Allah Alaikum Abu Abdullah. Salaamu Allah You know, on the night of the 11th of Muharram, <coughs> when the body of Imam Hussein Hussain was left alone in the plains of Kabra, they saw the ring of the Prophet السلام, on the hand of Imam Hussein Hussain So one of those men, he came and he tried to loot by removing the, thing, removing the ring from the hand of the Imam السلام, but it was too tight. So you know what he did? He took out a knife and he cut the finger of the Imam alayhi salam. Salamu alayki ya Abdullah. But sometimes when we see ourselves in any sense of deficiency, we're always ready to go and fix that issue. But how come when it comes to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not ready to a diagnosing what it is that we're encountering? Again, when you see that that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in your heart, then what is it within me that's preventing me from reaching that state? We need to make sure that we're diagnosing it and then that we're seeking the cure in order to allow for ourselves to ascend toward that height where we become from amongst the beloveds of our Creator. Otherwise again, what is this all about in the first place? 
And we come and we see that in Dua Abu Hamza al-Thimali of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salatu wasalam, he speaks to two issues, he speaks to two diseases of the heart that we, that's oftentimes overcome our souls, whereby we are prevented from being amongst the beloveds of our Creator. He states in Dua Abu Hamza, he states, Allahumma inni kullama qultu qad tahayyatu wa ta'abba'atu wa qumtu lissalati bayna yadayk wa najaytuk. Really beautiful words from the Imam alayhi salam. He states, Oh Allah, every time that I stand and I begin to prepare for prayers, I go and I stand on my prayer mat and I make wudu, I stand in front of you, I'm standing between your hands and I know that I have to be in a state of obedience and of submission and of servitude to you. Al-qaytu alayya nu'asan idha anasallayt. Oh Allah, at that moment when I'm standing in front of you, about to pray to you, all of a sudden, I start feeling a sense of exhaustion. I start feeling a sense of tiredness. I start feeling a sense of slumber. And oh Allah, when I begin to make that dua to you during the course, even though I've made all of the correct preparations to do so, I want to whisper to you. I want to pray to you. I want to make dua to you. But I just don't feel like it. What is the cause? The Imam والسلام, he's reciting these words so that we think about it, so that we reflect upon it. How can we be the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we fail to even strive towards standing in front of God and focusing for two or three or four or five minutes? It doesn't take that long. If every rakah in your prayer is one minute long, that's 17 minutes for the entirety of the day. For the entirety of the day, 17 minutes. Let's say you add some dua, you add iqama, you add tasbihat al-zahra, 25 minutes. You could finish all of your prayers in 25 minutes out of 24 hours. And if you do a little bit more dua and tasbih, and you recite sajda, you make sajda shukr after the prayers, 30 minutes out of 24 hours, 23 and a half hours is for you. Half an hour of your day, of my day, is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It seems so easy. So simple. Half an hour, I could do that. And then if you add the performance of the night prayer, and all of the recommended prayers, the nawafil, and so on and so forth, one hour. One hour of your entire day, immediately you transcend amongst the closest of the beloveds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. One hour. A day. Why is it so difficult? The Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he's stating, Oh Allah, what is it? What's wrong with me? Mali. What's up? What's going on in here? What's going on in here? What prevents me from being amongst those who is able to just stand in front of you for half an hour or 25 minutes a day? The sense of the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has been removed from us. And this is something that we need to be concerned about. <laughs> Let me continue. The Imam alayhi salatu wa salam continues. He states, Mali, what's wrong with me? Kullama qultu qad saluhat sarirati wa qaruba min majalis at tawabin majlisi aradat li baliyatun azalat qadami wa halat Baini wa bayna khidmatika, ya Sayyidi. He states, what is wrong with me? Whenever I feel that myself has become a little bit better, I feel good about myself, I know that I'm doing the right thing, and I begin to enter into that gathering in which I seek forgiveness from you, O oh Allah. I say, O oh Allah, I promise I will never go back toward that sin. O oh Allah, I promise from this day I will start to pray. I promise from this day I will start to recite Qur'an. I promise from this day I'm going to do my best. All of a sudden, I make that commitment. The next day comes and I stand in front of you and my feet begin to shake and my feet begin to ache and I begin to say, no, it's okay. Servitude to you, it can wait another day. How many of us go through this? 
That's something dangerous. That's something dangerous that I talk to my own soul. How many times do we stand in front of prayer and we just want to get it over with? How many times do we stand in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then when we don't get what we want, Oh Allah, why are you doing this to us? You always do this to us, Mama. 30 minutes, 25 minutes of my day, why can't I dedicate it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Again, what's the cause of it? There's one thing. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed again what is known as his tawfiq from us so that we're unable to allow for ourselves to be in that sense and in that state of communication with our Creator. In the same way that when Ali ibn Abi Talib states, Ilahi, sabartu ala adabik, fakaifa asbiru ala firaqik. Oh Allah, I can deal with your punishment. But how can I deal with being distant from you? We say, oh Allah, me punishment? Forget that. I'm not gonna get that, I'm good. I came to the majlis of Hussein. You can't even pray. I cried for Hussein. You can't even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. I love the Prophet and his family. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni. God states in the Holy Quran that, O oh Messenger of God, if they, if, if, if they claim that they love me, then tell them to follow you. The Messenger said to pray, said to fast, said to make zakat, he said to go for hajj. He said to do this, he said to do that. Tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is tawfiq really, really quickly? Tawfiq is what I like to call the divine glue. It allows for everything to stick together. The ability and the potential that we have within us, God allows for us to be pushed forth so that we're able to get to where it is that we need to be. I can't pray, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me tawfiq so that I'm able to pray. When we're going through that, how come we don't say, Oh Allah, help me in this. Oh Allah, if there's something that's hindering from me, it's hindering this prayer from being formulated, from this dua from being recited, from the Quran to be recited, then Oh Allah, help me get there and beg God. Because again, when that door is closed, and that when we start to not even see that door anymore, we need to go back and check ourselves. إِنَّ لِلْقُلُوبِ إِقْبَالًا وَإِذْبَارًا Sometimes the heart wants, sometimes the heart doesn't want. When it doesn't want for a really long time, we need to go back and think where we're at. And this brings me then toward the third dimension. And that is then what are the qualities of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And these qualities, every one of them that I'm going to mention, three or four of them, are also the means by which we overcome these hurdles of having a lack of tawfiq in terms of allowing for ourselves to reach that state of spiritual proximity to our Creator. We come and we see number one. The first mechanism or the first means to become a beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be able to overcome those obstacles of laziness or of not being able to connect with our Creator is that we should always be in a state of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith from the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, it states, Alamat hubbullah hubbu dhikrih wa alamat bughullah bughu dhikrih. That the sign of the one who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he loves to remember God. And the sign of the one who hates God is the one who hates God's remembrance. Do you love to be in a gathering? Do I love to be in a gathering where we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where we want to learn about God? Where we are, have the sense of desire to recite Quran? To make dua? To recite tasbihat? Or even to do something as general like I mentioned as the other day, like walk in the park and look up at the signs of the Creator. That the first thing that we have to do is just be in a state where we are in God's remembrance, performing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone says, how can I get there if in the first place I have a difficult time standing in front of creator, cre my, my Creator in, in the first place? I can't pray, I can't fast, my feet begin to shake, I get nervous, I get lazy, all of these things happen to me. Sometimes you need to just push. You just need to deal with it. You need to exert yourself and put forth an extra effort. 
when you're fasting during the holy month of Ramadan, fasting is challenging. You know that you have to do it. You fasted all the way till 7 p.m. You have 45 minutes or an hour remaining. You just know sometimes you just got to do it. So you just got to push through and you got to do it. And when you do it, you just feel good about yourself. Similarly, for instance, when it comes toward school or when it comes toward work, you don't like to do every single task that you do. But at the end of it, you just know that you have to do it. Sometimes we're going to go through certain states in our spirituality where we're not going to feel so comfortable, but you can't give up. You have to just keep on pushing and keep on striving. You just have to get through it. And at the end of it, you just feel a lot better. Anyone ever run before? You're running outside. We are talking about this, a couple of us, yesterday. You're running outside, and nobody likes running, let's be honest. We like how it feels after. We don't like it in the middle of it, especially the first five minutes, the first seven minutes, and the first 12 minutes. And then the first 15 minutes. You get your 45 minute run, and then you look at your watch, you look at your phone, or you hear the guy saying, you've done 40 minutes already. You're like, okay, I can do this. Just did 40 minutes. You're panting, you're breathing, you're about to fall flat on your face and die. <laughs> but you know that the end is coming. And after you finish it, how good do you feel? Runner's high. You feel good. You feel content. You feel happy. You can deal with this. You did it. And you know what? You're going to do it again tomorrow. Or you're going to do it the day after that. You just feel this burden is sort of removed from you. You have to go through the process. And at the end of it, you feel a sense of contentment. You have to just force yourself sometimes to be in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shouldn't be that challenging though. It's not physically taxing. You. Why would it be so horrific to remember your God once in a while? But for whatever reason, say it. Allah Akbar. Some people they say, you know all of these rituals that we perform? I've heard it forever. I used to say, ask my parents the same thing actually, to be honest with you. On Laylatul Qadr, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. You go into a mosque, for instance, on the night of Laylatul Qadr, someone's reciting Astaghfirullah so mechanically a hundred times that if someone were to walk in, it would seem like it's a bunch of robots just reading the same exact thing. But imagine that during the course of that Istighfar that we're reciting, for one person in that gathering, or maybe in the 50 or 70 or 100 years that we live, we perform that A'mal 70 times, one of those Istighfar out of those 50,000 that we recite, one of them, we say it with a sense of sincerity. That's why we are told, say it 70 times, say it 100 times, we have other adhkar, say this 1,000 times, say this 1,200 times, recite this 40 consecutive days, recite that 40 consecutive days, do this, do that. One time it's going to click. But it starts with practice, and it starts with putting forth that effort. You have to keep on doing it, and finally something is going to happen. Something is going to click. There's going to be some fruition. At the end of the day, it starts with us pushing forth and putting forth that effort and saying, Oh Allah, I want to be from amongst your beloveds, so I am going to dedicate myself toward remembering you, even if it means that I have to stand up in the middle of the night and say, Allahu Akbar a thousand times. That's number one. The second way or the second quality of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according toward our traditions, going back toward that same point that I just concluded with, is that we spend a portion of our night in dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does this mean? As I mentioned the other night, the anecdote of that young man who performed the night prayer for however many consecutive nights, that there's something about dedicating yourself to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last third of the night, there's something unique about that time. And in the tradition it is stated from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he's telling one of his companions that one day Musa alayhi salam was in conversation with God. And God, he says to Musa alayhi salam, Yabna Imran, O son of Imran, Kababa man za'ima annahu yuhibbuni fa'idha jannahu al-layl nama anni alaysa kulli muhibbin yuhibbu khalwat habiba. He states, O oh son of Imran, O oh Musa, the liar is the one who says that he loves me but does not spend a portion of the night in conversing with me. 
For does not every beloved wish to stay up with his beloved in the darkness of the night? You love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put his love in our hearts. That starts with us doing things that are not always so comfortable. We wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you make wudu when your bed is a lot more comfortable. It's a lot warmer, it's a lot colder, whatever it is that we like. We make that wudu, we open up the prayer mat and we begin to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You begin to converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, even on the night of the 11th of Muharram, and I'll talk about this later on, on another night, but even on the night of the 11th of Muharram, when the tents were burning, Lady Zainab السلام, had her hands raised in performing the night prayer. The tents are burning, the bodies of her family members are butchered all across the plains of Karbala. And she has her hands raised in conversation with her Lord. Thirdly, very quickly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the third quality of the believer or the third quality of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that they follow the Prophet alayhi salam and walk in his footsteps. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ That, O oh Messenger, say that if they claim to love me, then say, follow me, meaning follow the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, and they will find that God loves them back and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their sins. To follow the Prophet, to learn about the life and the legacy of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to go and do your best toward doing whatever it is that he said. He said to pray like this, we pray like this. He said to make dua like this, we make dua like this. He said to converse and treat your family members like this, that's the way we're going to treat our family members. Because that's the way that the Prophet والسلام, he instructed for us. And fourthly, because my time is running out, the fourth way to become a beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to love Hussein. Is to love Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. What's the evidence? Ahabbullah min ahabba Hussein. That Allah loves the one who loves Hussein. You know what's interesting? All of these others, they all state, for instance, that if you want to love Allah, you have to do this. This tradition states, Ahabbullah min ahabba Hussein. It starts with Allah loving the one who does. Not if you want Allah to love, then you do this. Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn ahabbullah man ahabba Husayn. Ali tonight's night of tragedy, man. Let's turn off those lights, huh? Tonight, my friends, is the night of the 9th of Muharram. I told you a couple of nights ago that last Thursday was my daughter's first day of school. And I know my wife, she went and she told a lot of people that I'm a big crybaby, and I am. She went and she told everyone that when my daughter went to school, that I was embarrassing her uh, because I was crying so much in the pre-K classroom, even though the first day of school was only an hour and a half. <laughs> the minute that we exited the school, I thought to myself, I'm undergoing so much grief for an hour and a half because my daughter for the first time in my life is away from me. And there's no one that I know in that classroom who cares about my daughter, or who loves my daughter in the same way that any of us would. And I thought about what Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam was feeling like on the day of Ashura when he watched his son Ali al-Akbar leave on that horse toward going to the middle of the battlefield. Do you know how painful it was? I swear to you, my friends, that every single one who went out and fought on the day of Ashura and who was killed in the hands of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, nothing was as painful as when Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, had to watch his son Ali al Akbar be killed in front of his eyes. Nothing. Not the six month old that pierced. Ali, that, that pierced Imam al-Hussein so much.
because he watched that son of his grow 26, 27 years. He watched him in front of him and he raised him into a man and he was always loyal and always by the side of his father. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he has to watch him ride into the sunset only to be slaughtered in the most horrific way that we can ever imagine. Which is why Fatima bint al Hussein, one of the daughters of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when she got back to Medina, she narrates that my father on the day of Ashura, he died three times. And every one of these three times had to do with Ali al-Akbar. He says that the first time that my father died on the 10th of Muharram was when he had to watch Ali al-Akbar leave for the first time from that tent. The second time that my father died on the 10th of Muharram was, was, was when Ali al Akbar returned back to the tent and said, Oh Aba Abdullah, inna al Atash qad qatalani, that surely the thirst is killing me. And the third time that my father died on the day of Ashura was when he saw the battered and bruised body of his son Ali al Akbar. Forgive me, my dear sisters and brothers, because this one is really hard to read. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to narrate to you all of the details of what happens to our master Ali al Akbar tonight. And if I can't, I apologize and I'll save it for the 10th of Muharram. But I will just say this, my dear brothers and sisters, that Ali al Akbar was a man who in terms of his physical face and in terms of his etiquette, in terms of his speech, according to traditions, mirrored that of the Messenger of God salam. The women would state that whenever we missed the presence of our grandfather Muhammad, we would always ask to see the face and hear the voice of Ali al-Akbar. Which is why it is said that when Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he is approached by Ali al-Akbar after all of the companions and after all of his comrades had been killed, Ali al-Akbar was the first from amongst the family members of Banu Hashim to come toward Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam to seek permission. But before I even get there on the night of Ashura, when Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he turns off those candles, he turns off those lanterns, and he tells everyone else to go, he states the only one who has to say is my son Ali al-Akbar. He even told Abu al-Fadl Abbas that he should take his brothers and go back toward Kufa, go back toward Medina, go back to wherever they were safe. He just needed his son Ali al-Akbar because that was his sacrifice on the day of Ashura. And it is said that when Ali al-Akbar, he comes toward Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Ya Abata, Ya Aba Abdullah, Halli min ruqsa, do you give me permission, O oh my master, O oh my father, Aba Abdullah? To everyone else, Imam al-Hussein categorically said absolutely not, at least the first time. He said, there is no way that you are going to fight. But when he saw Ali al-Akbar, he needed to demonstrate to everyone else that he was also giving out of himself. So he looked at the face of Ali al-Akbar, the face of the Messenger of God, alayhi salam, and he just looked at him and he embraced him. And he became oh, so overcome with emotion that that was the first time that he fell unconscious on the day of Ashura, we mentioned the other night, the second time was when Qasim was leaving. And it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, a few moments later, he rises. Again, he looks toward Ali and al Akbar and he says, Oh Akbar, before you go out, please go and bid farewell to your mother Layla. Go bid farewell to your aunt Zainab. It is said that Ali and al Akbar, he prepares himself for battle. He goes and he wears his turban, he wears his helmet, he wears his armor, he gathers together his sword and then he goes toward the tent of the women. When he stands in the tent, all of the women, they stand up, they all embrace Ali and Akbar, and they say, Oh Ali, make us proud today. But Layla at the corner, she was so concerned about her son. Ali and Akbar, he exits from the tent. He goes and he tells his father, Oh Abba Abdullah, don't worry about me, for I've been under the tutelage of my uncle Abbas. I will be successful today. And it is said that he goes, he rides, he kills some of the enemy, and it is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is watching on a nearby hill. He's looking and he's watching, and every single time he smiles, Layla says, Oh Aba Abdullah, why are you smiling? At this moment, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, Because he struck one of the enemy and he's killed them. And at one moment, it is said that Imam al Hussein was standing, and all of a sudden, his face was filled with anxiety, and Layla says, Oh Aba Abdullah, what is happening to my son? At this moment, Imam al Hussein says, Oh 
Layla, I'm worried about my son. I've heard from my grandfather, the messenger of God, that the one, the mother who makes a desperate dua, it's bound to be responded to. So go back into the tent and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm able to see my son one final time. Do you know what he's, you know what she says? She goes back into the tent. She falls to the ground. She raises her hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She says, oh Allah, who returned Yusuf back to Yaqub. Oh Allah, who returned Ismail back to Hajar. I ask you bi ghurbat al Hussein. I ask you by the anxiety of Hussein. As'aluka bi atash al Hussein. I ask you by the thirst of Hussein. I ask you by the loneliness of Hussein. Return my son back to me one final time. And at that moment, Hadin al Akbar, he killed that man. He, ride, he rode back toward Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He came down from the tent, Imam al Hussein. He came down from his horse. Imam al Hussein embraced him. And then he said, Go and see your mother Layla. Go and see your aunt Zainab. He goes one final time. He embraces all of them. Imam al Hussein calls from outside of the tent, O oh, women, Qumna ya haram. O oh, my sisters, O oh, my, oh, my wives, O oh, my daughters, stand up and bid farewell to the young man. They all go and they kiss Ali and al Akbar. Then he comes out and he says, O oh, my father, Abba Abdullah, in al Atash qad qatalani. O oh, my father, this armor is really heavy on my back and the thirst of Karbala is killing me. Give me one sip of water and I will destroy the entire army of Umar ibn Sa'd. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam doesn't know what to tell his son. So you know what he does? He was in desperation. He knows that his son is dying of thirst in and of itself. So you know what the narration states? Allahu Akbar. He embraces his son Ali al Akbar and then he places his tongue into the mouth of Ali al Akbar because he doesn't know what to tell him. You know what the narration states? That Ali al Akbar, he falls backwards to the ground and he says, Oh my father, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you were more thirsty than I. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says, Go, because I promised that my grandfather has a cup of water for you in paradise. It is said that Ali in al Akbar gets back on that horse. He begins to ride toward the plains of Karbala, calling out, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali, Nahnu wa baytullah awla bin Nabi, Adribukum bis Saifi Ahmi an Abi, Dharaba Ghulam in Hashimi in Ali. Ali al Akbar kills 120 people. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is watching when all of a sudden Ali al Akbar he tries to enter into the middle of the army of Umar ibn Sa'd and instead stated that one man he comes and he takes a spear and he pushes it through the chest of Ali al Akbar and another man comes and he takes a dagger which strikes the helmet of Ali al Akbar. The helmet breaks, the blood begins to gush, it goes on top of the eyes of the whole the horse doesn't know which way to go, so it enters into the army of Umar ibn Sa'd. One man strikes him from the right, another man comes and strikes him from the left. He calls out, Abba, alayka min salam Oh my father, my last farewell on you. You know what happens, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He gets on top of his horse, he begins to ride toward Ali al Akbar. This is his son. He's calling out, Ali, Ali, Ali. At this moment, it is said that Sukaina, she exits from the tent and she says oh my father Abba Abdullah you're riding the wrong way my brother's body is there she says that he says la talumuni la talumini hadha bunayya Ali how can you blame me this is my son Ali in al-Akbar Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is on that horse. He finally reaches the body of his son Ali al Akbar, only to see it dismembered. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he tries to get down from his horse. You know what happens when you go through something really difficult? You can't feel your legs. Hamid ibn Muslim he says, I saw Abu Abdullah, but he was not getting down from the horse. He had to push himself off the horse. He lands on the body of his son. His son Ali al Akbar. Akbar. And he sees Ali al Akbar smiling and he says, Oh my dear son, why do I see you smiling? He says, Because my grandfather Muhammad says that he's, my grandfather Muhammad said that he has a cup of water for me and he's bringing it closer to me. And he says he has one for you in only one hour that you're also going to drink from that.
And then at this moment, he sees Ali al Akbar. He has a sense of grief on his face. He says, Oh, my son Ali. Oh, my son Ali, why do I see you in this state of grief? You just saw your grandfather giving you some water. He said, I saw my grandmother, Fatima al Zahra. She stood up and she began to beat herself, calling out, Ya Habibi, Al she begins to scream out, Ya Habibi, Ya Hussein. <laughs> At this moment, it is said that Imam Al Hussein he picks up the body of Ali Al Akbar. He calls out, Ya Dunya, Ya Bunayya in the Dunya Ba'dak Al Afa, O world. Oh my son, this world without my son is no longer worth living. He holds his son close to his chest and begins to scream out, Ali, Ya Ali. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein.